What about the legal privilege in Switzerland? What are future changes? Well, so your legal privilege in Switzerland, I think you need to separate between legal privilege for external counsel and internal counsel, of course. Uh, we have a development that uh, uh, legal privilege for internal counsel was adopted for civil proceedings. It's not into force yet. It will come into force. I believe it will um, be very helpful, I believe, for companies. It will be helpful in terms of structuring uh, legal departments and I believe it will also ultimately be beneficial for the cooperation between in-house counsel and outside counsel. I believe quite a bit of work uh, will be able uh, to be done inside the company by people that are well equipped to do it, by people that understand the company uh, and ultimately also in terms of quality that will result in better quality and will make things easier for external counsel to take that information and then use it the way, uh, you know, uh, most properly, you know, for, for the company as such. Regarding this uh, new draft uh, seem to be done here in Switzerland, regarding the legal privilege, what's your opinion? Uh, I think it's a, it's a great step forward and because at the end of the day, uh, the companies based in Switzerland have a, a great exposure to abroad and in particular to the US. So when uh, facing an e-discovery uh, process, uh, they, they play in disadvantage. And at the end of the day, if we can have this specific recognition, legal recognition, at least for the civil procedures, uh, I, I think that the, the, the in-house legal departments will be able to provide a sound legal advice to the business colleagues that will rely on the legal privilege. So that's that's really good news. And let's see how it works. And then afterwards, the case law uh, just uh, further fine-tunes the, the, the regulation. Legal privilege from a general counsel point of view. What will we change? I think from a general counsel point of view, if the new law, when the new law enters into force, the new article, it is really the, the general counsel has to review the setup of the legal team because to make sure that we get advantage out of this new law and also to inform the business that there will be changes, changes to the communication, to the way we send out things just to make sure that we comply and that we take out the advantage that it's really legally privileged. I really liked it very much. I really had fun being on the panel. Uh, a lot of great colleagues, exciting discussions, a lot of takeaways for me. Uh, as you know, I'm a bit, uh, a bit supporter of the legal privilege for ACC, but even I could learn something in today's session. So thank you very much for that. Nowadays, the role of the chief legal officer is more and more asking to be present in a CEO table. What do you think about this? That is the right solution as a matter of fact. It's important. Uh, we always talk about uh, enabling uh, the business, uh, but actually the role of the CLO is also really looking after the executive committee and uh, being the real counsel of the CEO or the CFO in uh, in the company. So being around the table, I don't think it's just an opportunity, it's a necessity at the end of the day to make sure that uh, the interests of the company are properly um, taken care of. Before we have talked about how to attract young lawyers to a company beyond salaries, but how to attract general counsels beyond salaries in a company? I think it's a very relevant question. I think it's all about chemistry with the CEO and the C-suite executive. Uh, first of all, it's what's the mandate? What, what are you here for? Is it to build? Is it to transform? So what's the what's the trigger from uh, from a development perspective from a GC? And then probably to understand what are the key challenges of a company and are you appealed by the what has to be achieved from your perspective on the team, on the regulatory element, for instance, but also what are you going to build with a, with a CEO? And that's in particular what I, it would attract me typically, what the Mondays, what the story behind. Uh, what could you say, for example, regarding the in-house lawyers and law firms? What's the difference in terms of salaries? Yes, of course. So uh, law firms, in law firms the salaries are quite transparent. Uh, because it's well known what the good law firms are paying. You can even look it up online, what they are paying. So salaries are more or less the same for everyone. There's no negotiation room. 
Um, in-house it looks very different um, because obviously there's no transparency really for in-house salaries. So it very much depends on um, what kind of role um, the company is recruiting for, in which sector, um, w what exactly the remit of the role is. So there are lots of factors that influence the salary in the, on the in-house side and also on the negotiation of the candidate, obviously. So it's, uh, it's up to you uh, as a candidate then to negotiate a good salary uh, as, far as, as much as possible. And, and beyond salaries, young lawyers, they are looking for also other things. What are they looking for? Yes. Yeah, I would say uh, they, um, they're definitely looking for a good salary, but they're also looking for more work-life balance, for more flexibility, um, uh, being able to work from home uh, more. Um, and also, I think what is important for them that they work for a company that has some kind of meaning or sense that does something purposeful that's very important for these uh, for the younger generation as well so yeah it's, they are overall in that sense quite demanding mm -hmm.